What we are going to do now is to have a look at the earliest evidence for the Greek New Testament. We may have heard about the reliable transmission of the Old Testament and how accurate it is, but for the New Testament, all sorts of different claims have been made. So we are going to have a look at the very early evidence there is. But let's start with a sort of thought experiment. If every manuscript in any museum or library, or etc., would disappear right now, sort of in puff of smoke or whatever, big fire, you imagine, what would happen to the Bibles you have at home? Absolutely nothing. I mean, your Bible would remain just as reliable as it is with all those manuscripts in all those libraries. And why is that so? Because our New Testament is the result of all that copying work. And the evidence has been used to create very accurate uh, editions of the Greek New Testament and ultimately also translations into our own language. So in a sense, it's great that all those manuscripts are there, but, I, well, and I will be out of a job when they would all disappear immediately, but still, um, there is a sense we could survive without them just as sort of the Old Testament could survive on sort of very many ages in which there was no physical evidence. We rely on the copying process and on average that works very well. If you're into classical music, uh, Bach's, uh, Bach's cantates, we rely on the transmission process of them. If you love to read C.S. Lewis, we basically rely on his manuscript being copied and then printed, etc., and then uh, uh, distributed. We rely constantly on copying process. But of course, with the New Testament, we cannot compare what we have in our New Testament. For example, Paul's letter to the Romans with the letter he sent to Rome, roughly in the middle of the first century. Simply, that letter has perished. It's probably literally been read to bits, you know, and it's all perished. And we have to rely on the copies that were made. Perhaps the copies we uh, have nowadays are made from the letter sent to Rome. That's very well possible. But it may even be that Paul kept himself copies of his own correspondence. I do that all the time. I make sure that I have a copy of every letter I send. So it may be that all our texts go back to Paul's copy rather than to the copy he sent to Rome. We, do, we don't know. But we have a gap between when Paul wrote it and our earliest evidence. Now, let's have a look at what is the earliest evidence. What does the earliest uh, Manuscripts, what do they tell us? Well, they tell us something disturbing. I'm going to break some bad news to you. Even in the earliest manuscripts we have, we can see that there are differences between them. Tiny differences, and we're going even to have a look at uh, one of them, but there are differences between them. And actually, if you look at all the manuscripts we have of the Greek New Testament, then there are actually, I mean, forgive me to say it, but there are thousands and thousands of differences between them. So how in all this situation can we talk about a reliable transmission of the Greek New Testament? Now, and it, as is always the case, it helps when you sit down and start to use your God-given intellect on those things. We all have a mind, so let's use it. Let's think about it. And we will start in this talk by having a look at the oldest evidence we have. And I'm going to show you three manuscripts. And we're going to be so thorough that I'm going to show you at least half of them, of each. So 
have a, have a sit back. This is probably, possibly, the earliest one. This is half of the manuscript. The other half is on the other side of the bit of papyrus. Um, normally dated towards the middle of the second century, uh, but of course, as happens with these things, uh, people start to date it later and later and later for all sorts of reasons, etc. But here we have a bit of John's Gospel. This one probably comes from the same time, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe a bit later. This is half of the manuscript. What's the other half? Of the other side of the papyrus. Now this starts to become a little bit fragmentary, isn't it? Well, I'll show you the third one, and we're going actually to have a bit of a look at it. This is the third one. This is one half, and that is the other half. These are the three oldest manuscripts, and each of them comes from within roughly 100, 120, 130 years after the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of John were written. Gosh, is the transmission of the Greek New Testament in such a poor state? Uh, poor state? Because let's face it, in order to get to a complete New Testament, you will need a lot of these fragments. Now, try to rip up your New Testament in tiny bits and see you know, how many of them you get. So, first thing we should bear in mind is that the oldest evidence we have are useful, because they are old evidence, but they are not so much useful to give us the whole Greek New Testament, now for them, uh, for that we need later manuscript. They are useful because they give us spot checks in what is happening. And one of the great things about these uh, papyri fragments is that they actually tell us that the situation in the second century was not that different from the third, the fourth, the fifth, or the sixth. Actually, all the things we see happening in the, in the fourth century, where we have plenty of evidence, we're going to talk about that later, other time, um, all the things we see happening there we already see on occasion happening in the very early manuscript. But how come that some of the early manuscripts seem already to contain uh, problems? Okay, where do all these manuscripts come from, the papyrus manuscript? Well, this is sort of Roman Empire in, in the second century. Um, and where do all the manuscripts come from? Just this space here, Egypt. And actually, almost, uh, only a couple of places in Egypt. And that is, of course, papyrus normally perishes naturally quite rapidly. All the papyrus that was used in Italy, Greece, or, or wherever, perhaps even as far uh, as Gaul, um, that papyrus would have no, uh, naturally uh, decomposed but it's only in the dry sands of Egypt where those manuscripts survive. Now, Egypt, with all due apology to any Egyptians uh, present here, was not the center of the world of the Roman Empire. Egypt was sort of important, but at the same time, as soon as you went further south from Alexandria, you were pretty quickly in the middle of nowhere. And that is where these manuscripts come from. And these fragments were not found carefully preserved in rich monasteries or something. They were all found on rubbish heaps. So this to, to qualify a little bit the value of those oldest manuscripts we have. They come from a corner of the Roman Empire, and all of them ended up, one way or the other, on rubbish heaps. Um, still, they are early, and early is interesting. I mean, dating matters. Um, how are those manuscripts actually dated? I mean, 
how there's no date on it. Well, um, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, if you find an old newspaper from, say, the second half of the 19th century, okay, there is a date on it, but if the date is rubbed off, okay, you can perhaps see the news and what sort of, of, of news is important. Okay, but you have a little bit of a boring part where you can't date. How can you date it? Well, actually, the font that was used to print in the second half of the 19th century is a different font than we use now for newspaper printing. Well, that is, of course, printing. Have you ever compared your handwriting with that of your parents or your grandparents? You actually notice that they write differently. They have been taught differently. Every handwriting, every script, you can date. Of course, it is not the most precise way of dating things, but still, you can date them. Uh, now this one used to be sort of dated to late second century, but as it happened, people say, yes, but no, somebody may have written the same script, that's what we're talking about, the same font, a couple of hundred years later. Of course, that is possible, but it is less likely. I mean, at the moment it is, the most manuscripts with this sort of uh, script that we can date, for example, when a piece or, uh, is written on the back of a tax return, which Egypt was very strong in, then we have a date. If it is written on the, uh, the back of a receipt for, uh, you know, for so many grains and it is dated to a particular emperor, we can date the script. So we can date some examples, but none of the biblical ones. But as I said, we could do without the old evidence, but we have the luxury of having some of it available. Now, what can we learn from such a thing? Um, it is a bit from the Gospel of John, and the first thing, what you almost might be able to see, so we have seen the back as well, which is sort of the other part of uh, John 18, uh, it, it is. We'll see, is this is a page. A, like, I have pages here. It is a page with front and a back. Um, so if it is a page, what is it not? It is not a roll, it is not a scroll. And actually, in the second century, still, both Jews and Romans would write all their literary works on rolls. That is what proper literature is written on. But as far back as the evidence goes, Christians used books for their New Testament. They were early adopters of a new technology, which was first mentioned in a sort of an epigram of Marshall in the second half of the first century. The Christians immediately picked up on that. So there is here a clear break with the synagogue tradition of using roles in early Christianity, because early Christianity en masse went over to the book form. And all biblical manuscripts we have from sort of first uh, eight, nine hundred years are all books, with one exception, but that is on a reused sort of uh, bit. The second thing we can learn from these early ones, um, th this is actually from a manuscript slightly later, but uh, the other manuscript did not have a very clear example. Here we have a little bit of Greek, so you have probably uh, know some of those letters uh, the manuscript says here, dia, then we get three letters with a line above, but it is Yesu, dia, Yesu, Christu, kai, which means and, and then theu, which is supposed to have four letters, but only the first and the last are written, and then a line above them. Now, this thing goes back to the earliest evidence. What did Christians do with some names? Jesus, okay, pretty important name in the context. Christ, 
I can see that. God, yes, pretty important word. There are about four or five words. Curios, Lord, is another one. And another one is Spirit. It is these words that Christians treat differently in their manuscript. Not in order to, to save space, but to give a certain reverence to these names. And here they are continuing actually something in the synagogue tradition, because in the Greek manuscripts of the Old Testament up to this time, and as far as our evidence go, goes, the tetragrammaton, the name of God, the four-letter name, was not written in Greek letters in a Greek manuscript, but in the middle of a Greek manuscript, you would get some old Hebrew letters, just written in a different thing. So you would happily read Greek and then suddenly some old Hebrew letters in between. Why? Because it's the name of God. Now, Christians did not do that, but they did something, uh, something different. They used the contractions, the first and the last letters, and put a line above them. But textual variants are early. Here is one. Um, this, well, yeah, this is all uh, Greek to you and to me. Um, this is a, a phrase where it says, uh, Pilate says, I did not find. So Pilate says, I did not find a cause to, for condemnation. Yes. This is what it means. Hey, this is a textual variant. Because the normal Greek text does not say, I do not find cause. But the normal text says, I found no cause. You expect the difference? In one case, is it the verb that is denied? I, f I did not find cause. In the normal text is, I found no cause. Now, the difference in, in meaning is not particularly big, but it is a textual variant and happens in the course of copying. Then, one final thing before we're going to round off. We have all heard of those thousands and thousands of Greek manuscripts there are, and that is the reason why our New Testament is so reliable. True, there are 5,000 or so manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. But here we have a little table about the first 500 years. And we see that in any 50 years block, well, here we get above 60, but it is much less. Um, you can also see that there is a bias in the dating because people tend to date something to a specific century, so that's why the 50s, more than to the break between two centuries. That's 500, 400, and 300. So there's sort of a statistical bias almost in, in how things are, are dated. Um, but when it comes to the oldest evidence, there isn't that much. But and that's what we're going to do in another talk. When we come to this stage, Suddenly, we are not talking about fragments anymore. We are talking about some complete Greek New Testaments without a single chapter missing. Now, then it becomes interesting. So, how are we going to use this sort of, perhaps slightly, uh, what is a cold shower type of talk in, in our teaching within the churches? Well, first is, avoid the type of discussion with, uh, for example, non-Christians, where you go into a shouting context, uh, contest as, my manuscript is older than your manuscript. Yes, we have very good old manuscripts, but they are fragments, and that sort of comparative type of uh, trying to establish superiority is not going to work in the long run. Uh, that's also not in the nature of copying. Um, secondly, 
those early fragments are important. We learn very positive things about them. For example, about that we used books from the very beginning. That is very important uh, stuff. And we learn about the type of errors people were making. And once you know the type of error, you know what the original text was. And the other thing is, those fragments were normally not the source for other copies later. So they are end bits in the transmission copy. But there is one argument we can make with the help of those early fragments we would not have been able to make otherwise. And that is this. There is no time, no period of dark ages in the transmission of the history. Actually, we get snippets from every bit of the transmission history of the Greek New Testament so that we know what was going on. And once you know the history, you have your way back to the origin. Thank you very much.